I want to invite you to continue to worship with us in this next song. It says, even when I don't see it, even when I don't feel it, our God is working. He is the truth. And I want to invite you to sing this over your life today. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, moving in our midst, I worship you, oh, I worship you. That is our God. That is who He is. He can make a way where there seems to be no way. Maybe I'm talking to somebody this morning and you need a way and you don't see a way forward. But if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you have the way maker with you and in you through His Holy Spirit. Well, I've gone overtime in all the services. It's kind of had, bad to hear that, isn't it? So I, I, I don't want to take a lot of time right now, but I do want to just thank you for your generosity. 
You guys know a little over six weeks ago, we had a tornado hit part of Sedgwick County and definitely took a hard hit on the, my, my hometown of Andover. And, you know, I, I drive past the damage all the time because it's really close to my house. And when I drive past those houses, I think about how difficult it must have been in those first minutes. Can you imagine a family walking out and their house is either gone or damaged past the point where they could stay there or an automobile? How, how, where do you go when your automobile is destroyed? in those first few minutes. And you know, oftentimes we could say, well, they have insurance, but think about those first minutes. And so it was instant that I came to you and said, let's, let's begin to raise funds for those who need help immediately. And we partnered with his, with his helping hands who's on the front line of answering a lot of these requests. And just in a short time, you raised over $100,000. And I wanted to give you a report because I've got the printout from his helping hands. And, and let me just tell you, you helped 40 families, 40 families in Andover. I mean, there are things like car rental, temporary living expenses, uh, rental equipment, an underinsured family, vehicle costs, baby furniture to help with a new baby, motel bills, moving truck costs, single mom with three kids, her car was totaled, liability, liability only on her car, we stepped in, helped her in that time. Food, furniture, clothing, just basic necessities. Over $100,000 has already been allocated directly to families who needed help because of your generosity. So, I, I know this is not very spiritual, I mean, but every once in a while, you know, there's a lot of notice in the news about a, a corporation that gives funds and then I'll look at that and think New Spring did more than that and we didn't make any noise at all so but isn't that terrible I, I shouldn't think in those that's probably a seed that I'm sowing to the dark side so uh, we'll just leave that there but while I'm bragging on you could I just tell you that for the Ukraine for believers in the Ukraine you guys raised over hundred and fourteen thousand dollars and that is already on its way I say this in the Lord, I am so proud of you. I'm so delighted to get to be your pastor. You are the most generous, godly church I know of in America. So thank you for your heart. Thank you for your heart. And I know that God, God will, the Bible tells us the person who gives to the poor lends to God. So you can never, never come out behind doing good things for God's people. I've been saying that to our board for over 35 years. A lot of times we close out a meeting with that. You can't you never you never wind up behind doing good things for God's people. So I'm going to ask our guest services to come forward to receive the offering. Go ahead and have a seat, if you will. I'll be back in just a moment to bring a talk called First Seeds. Thanks so much for being here today. Here are a couple things we want you to know about. Your dad rules. You know it, and we know you want everyone else to know it too. Celebrate the dad in your life by bringing him to New Spring on Father's Day weekend, June 18th and 19th. We'll be honoring and appreciating dads all weekend long, so you won't want to miss it. Are you divorced or separated? Divorce Care is a 13-week support group that will help you heal from the hurt. It's a warm, caring environment led by people who understand what you're going through, where you'll learn practical information that will help you deal with the challenges of divorce and gain hope for the future. This group begins meeting on Wednesday evening, July 13th. Register to attend at newspring.org slash divorce care. Again, we're so glad you're making New Spring a part of your weekend. Enjoy the rest of the service. When the pressures of life put a strain on us and deplete our energy, isn't it true that we feel it the most at home? In our marriage and with our family. Sometimes the most important relationships in life get our leftovers. But it doesn't have to be that way. What if you could get a power boost? This summer, get ready to go supernatural. Well, if you've been a new springer for a while, you know my average series is usually somewhere between three and five weeks. But this series is gonna be different because it just keeps getting longer and longer and longer and I keep bringing talks I didn't intend to bring. I honestly don't know when this series is gonna end. So uh, <laughs> just wanna let you know about that because I really get the sense that God is doing something in our church, very un even, even unusual for a new spring. So I'm gonna keep talking to you about it. And it's really critical that we talk about the family 
marriage, family relationships, because I really think that, well, I don't think, I know, I know it's the basic unit of life. Before there was a church, God instituted marriage and family. Before there was a nation, God instituted marriage and family. So it's critical that we talk about it. And it's very important to me. Um, I think especially this week, because yesterday, Mary Alice and I have been married for 45 years. And that's just hard. It's hard to imagine. And, and poor Mary Alice, although she wouldn't feel that way, but... Um, we got married on a Saturday. Yesterday was our anniversary, so it felt kind of funny because it was on a Saturday that we got married. Um, and the previous Saturday, I'd been called to my first church. So all 45 years, Mary Alice has been his pastor's wife. There never was a day of marriage that she wasn't a pastor's wife, but she's been so good-natured about it. And it gives me a chance just to share my heart to you. I just want to say thank you to you as a church for two things especially. Number one, in all the years that I've been here, in all these 37 years, you've always let me know that you wanted me to put my marriage and my family first. And not every church does that. And I owe you an infinite debt for that. And then secondly, you never made my family live in a glass house. You let us be real people. And again, I owe you more than I can possibly thank you for because you've allowed me to be a real person. And it just means so much to me. And I, again, I have the privilege of serving the greatest church in America. But I will say this series is going to take a little while because we have a whole lot to talk about. Now, the reason why this series is different, and in these 37 years, I think the first series on the family I did was 35 years ago. Um, and many of those series, it was like advice. We would talk about things like conflict resolution, communication in the home, roles of family and marriage. And, th and those are helpful things. I don't know that we're going to get into that very much in this series because what we're looking at here is a whole new way of living. And it's what I love about it. It's very simple. There's really one principle. Now, there are a lot of applications for that principle. I mean, if you want to think of it in metaphorical terms, it would be like this principle is like the Christmas tree and the applications are like ornaments that you're going to hang on the tree. And, and I'll help you with some of it. But like today, I don't even know that this is a sermon. This is just kind of a workshop. And I'm going to give you the tools, or I'm going to give you the basics, and then you're going to take this and apply it to your life. And one more thing I want to say before we go any further, because somebody could say, Mark, I'm single. I'm not married. Um, I'm not dating. I'm not sure what the future holds for me. I want you to know this principle is solid gold no matter what your life circumstance is. I mean, single or married, you can take this principle to work with you tomorrow. You can take it to interact with total strangers, and it will revolutionize any relationship. It's just that big. It simplifies life. And here is the principle, and I know if you've been with us since Mother's Day, you've heard me start every sermon with this verse, and I guess I'll keep doing it throughout the series. And here is the verse, Galatians chapter 6, verse 8. The one who sows or plants to please his sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Now, if you are a Christ follower, and I know I've shared this with you before, but I understand every week there are new travelers coming among us, so I just kind of want to give you a touch of review. If you're a Christ follower, you have two operating systems inside of you. One system, the Bible calls the flesh. It doesn't mean the skin that you have. The flesh is just a term for the old nature that we inherited from Adam. When Adam sinned, he passed on the sin nature to all of us, every human being. This is why, ladies, you're going to love this. This is why Jesus had to be born without a human father, because it is the father who passes down the sin nature. And every woman said, amen. You knew that, didn't you? <laughs> the only problem is all of us have one, male or female. No, there, okay. So here's the deal. We have that operating system within us. It is it's bent toward doing the wrong thing. Nobody has to coach us to do the wrong thing. If we follow our natural impulses, for the most part, we'll wind up doing, saying, acting in the wrong way. But when you accepted Jesus Christ, you got a second operating system. And this is always a challenge for me to explain. Because the second operating system is a person. He's much more than just this nature, this compulsion that we, that we inherited. When you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, God moves inside of you through the person of the Holy Spirit. So if you're a Christ follower, you have both the old side of you that is bent toward doing the wrong thing, and you also have God himself living inside, which is why oftentimes we feel pulled in separate directions. It is why you have this long discussion in the Bible about the conflict between the flesh and and the spirit. If you've come across that in the book of Romans 6 through 8, you know clearly what we're talking about now.
It is why Christ followers can do some stuff that is so bad that we wonder, how could a Christ follower do that? And, and never forget this, New Spring. You have a part of you that's not redeemed. You have a part of you that's not going to heaven. Thank God. In fact, losing that dark nature is why we have to either die or why we have to be changed at the rapture. That part of you, and isn't that great to know? I mean, I, I, share, I think I shared this in one of the devotionals that I read, and I've had pastors contact me throughout, you know, from the nation who read this devotional. I said, one of the questions I've been asked through the years is, will we recognize our loved ones in heaven? And I said, I think we'll be at least as smart in heaven as we are here in the earth. But I said, the one person I'm going to have a hard time recognizing is me. Because all my life, I've known me with anxiety, you know, with just challenges and issues and just temptations and difficulties. I can't wait to meet me in heaven when I'm just like Jesus Christ. I mean, isn't that awesome? Because I won't have this old nature with me. And just in case you're wondering if that's in the Bible, just look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, where the Bible says, we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So yes, indeed, we will be like Jesus without this crazy nature that we walk around with. But right now, we're dealing with this internal head button thing, this head button conflict between our old person and our new person in Jesus Christ. So... Before I get into today's talk, and please don't count this against my time because this is just introduction. <laughs> I've already told you I've been in overtime two services already. There's a reason why I keep repeating Galatians 6, 8. I mean, obviously it's the foundation of our principle, but beyond that, there's so much in that one verse that I almost have to like share a piece of it every week. So in the verse that we read a few moments ago where the Bible says the one who sows to the flesh will from the flesh reap decay, death, and destruction. The one who sows to the Spirit or sows to please the Spirit will reap everlasting life. There are two words that are critical that we focus on. The first word is the word to, T-O. Maybe a better English word would be toward. And, and think about this. You know, in, in our world, we live in an agricultural state. You know, we have very sophisticated machinery to do planting for us. We have sophisticated machinery to prepare the soil. In Bible days, they didn't have either one. And so consequently, planting wasn't done the way we know of planting today. Planting was done with broadcasting seed. If you were a farmer or a, what the Bible would call a sower in those days, you would have a bag of seed slung over your shoulder, either on your side or behind you, and you would reach into that bag and you would throw the seed in a direction. You would throw the seed into the soil. Now think about that in the context of our verse. The Bible says the one who plants toward the flesh will from the flesh reap death, decay, and destruction. Why? Because that's where we put the seed. We put that in our soil the soil of our life, and we threw it in the direction of our impulses. But the Bible says the one who throws the seed toward the Spirit will reap life. Now, at that point, it's kind of existential. Here's where it's going to get real practical. It's the second word. The second word is the word please. Because the Bible says the one who throws the seed to please his dark side. That's where it gets real practical. The one who throws the seed to please the Spirit will reap life. Because see, whenever you and I think about the seed, which we've talked about already, the seed is every thought we think, every word we say, every attitude we hold, everything that we do. We are going to throw those words, actions, thoughts, and attitudes. We're either going to throw them in the direction of what our dark side feels like doing, saying, thinking, feeling. Or we're going to throw that seed to please God. What does God want me to say? I mean, in practical terms. And we need to unscrew the halo starting with me. Um, if I'm out here on K96 and uh, somebody cuts me off and, and not only does he cut me off, he like gives me the one finger salute. <laughs> what do I feel like doing? Now, I'm not going to give him the same salute, but I may talk to him. <laughs> he can't hear me. Now, I just want you to know, I mean, I know you love your pastor and you want to believe the best about me. That is what I feel like doing at that moment. <laughs> and you know what I could do? I could throw that seed toward my feeling. But then I could think, what would God want me to do? Hey, I don't know. Maybe he's having a really bad day. Maybe somebody cut him off. 
What if I pray for him? What if instead of yelling at him and talking about how, you know, what... What if I just pray, God, I don't know what that man's going through today. See, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, think about how this works in in your house. If you're married or if you're dating or if you have kids, just think about this. I mean, so you understand, and by the way, don't count that against my time. I'm not into the sermon yet. (laughs) I'm just telling you, this is how that principle works. Okay, first seeds. I wasn't going to bring this talk. The, the, the big message is next week. It's called the Jesus Seeds. And it might be two weeks long. We shall see. <laughs> I didn't plan to preach it, but I just got into the Word of God. I begin to, uh, to look at life in the Spirit. And you find a lot of this in the book, book of Ephesians and Galatians and Philippians and Colossians, even some in the book of Romans. But I begin to explore what it's like to live in the Spirit. In other words, living pleasing the spirit with my words, my thoughts, my actions, my attitudes. So before we get into those first seeds, let me show you what life in the spirit is like. I'm going to spend most of the time today in the book of Ephesians chapter four and chapter five. So if you have a Bible, if you have an electronic device, uh, check out Ephesians chapter four, because this is where life in the spirit begins. Okay. Ephesians 4.22, put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. What is your old self? It's what the Bible calls the flesh. It's the dark side. It's still in you. But, and God is talking to Christ followers here. He, God is saying, put off your old self. This is like clothes. Now, here's the thing about your, spirit, your, your dark nature and my dark nature. The Bible says it's being corrupted by its deceitful desires. That's interesting. Deceitful desires. Okay. This is getting real practical for a moment. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever have your dark side give you an impulse and in that moment you say something that an hour later you're like, why did I say that? You know, why did I say, why did I say that to the person I love the most in the world? You see what I'm saying? In other words, you have a desire, but it's deceitful. In other words, when that does. When that desire came to you, it didn't tell you what the price tag was for that. And we look back and, and we ask, this, what is the question we ask? What was I thinking? Well, it's because the desires that we have from our old nature are deceitful. So the Bible is saying, take it off. You, 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 you got to decide what you're going to wear. I mean, this morning, you decided what you were going to wear. I guess you decided. I decided on this. I'm not sure why. I just went to my closet and said, guess I'll wear white jeans and a blue shirt. And the Bible is saying, you've got to decide what you're going to wear today. Are you going to wear the old nature? Well, let's read the rest of this. And I want to just take this gradually. Verse 23 says, be made new in the attitude of your minds. I could preach the rest of the message on this. Because what the Bible is talking about here is accept your new identity in Jesus Christ. Ladies, if you're a Christ follower, what does the Bible say you are? The Bible says you're a princess. You're a daughter of God. You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You're going to live forever. God says in his word that you are innocent in his sight. You got to get up in the morning and decide, I'm going to accept my new identity in Christ, not the identity that I inherited from Adam. I mean, I, if I go by what I feel like, I feel like, well, I'm this and I'm that and I've done this and I've done that and I'm bad at this and I've got all these problems. And you know what? If we accept that identity, guess what we're going to do? We're going to put on the old person because that's what we feel like. But the Bible says put off their old person, accept your new identity in Christ. You're a princess of God. You're a prince of God. You want to behave like a princess. You want to behave like a prince. And you want to put on your new person in Jesus Christ. I got ahead of myself. Verse 24. Put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, you know, a lot of times when we're reading the Bible, we find that word like righteousness and holiness. It's like, well, these are a couple of synonyms that God just threw in there. No, no, no. This is important. Righteousness. Righteousness is about me being right with you. Righteousness is me being right with Mary Alice. Righteousness is horizontal. Righteousness is being right with our fellow man. 
The Bible tells me, Mark, if you will put off that old nature, if you will accept your new identity in Jesus Christ, that you're a prince of God, and you'll put on the new nature, and you start thinking about talking and acting and thinking to please the Holy Spirit, God said, you will be right with your fellow man, you'll be right with people, and then you will have holiness, you'll be right with God. Big stuff. Life in the Spirit. Okay, I'm finally getting to the sermon now. Did we start the clock? First seeds. Stay in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4 verse 25. Therefore, rejecting all falsity and being done with it, let everyone express the truth. I don't know if this is up on the iMac behind me, but in my notes, there's a word underlined. It is the word the. The truth. That's very important in 2022 because people have come to believe that we have now my truth. My truth. That is six inches on the other side of certifiably insane. There is no such thing as my truth. There is no such thing as your truth. That was a thought dreamed up by the crazy people of this world. I mean, for one thing, if you want to know how crazy it is, if you're going down to the courthouse and you, you got to go up and testify, try that on the bailiff. Do you swear to tell the whole truth, the, you know, nothing but the truth? You know, you're like, well, I'm going to tell my truth. <laughs> Boys and girls, can you spell perjury? <laughs> no, no, no. This is, where, this is where a great harvest starts. And you know what? If you skip this one, the rest of them won't work. Truth. First seed, truth. Now, <laughs> Can we all take, a, uh, all take a breath and admit, starting with your pastor, that this isn't easy? You know, because, I mean, if someone asks us, do, do you tell the truth? Well, we would say, yes, I tell the truth. And then under our breath, we would say, generally. <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's always been hard for God followers. I'm talking about heroes. This truth thing has been a challenge. I mean, what did Abraham say about Sarah? She's my sister. Jacob told his daddy, I am Esau. We saw David last week. Peter, I don't know the man three times. My old nature lies. And your old nature lies. Your old nature has a problem with truth. Now, the Holy Spirit is about truth. So you and I are going to have to ask before we sow this first seed, am I going to put off the old person and put on the new person? Because truth is critical and especially in the family. Now, I want us to ask ourselves four questions. You don't need to answer for me. You just got to answer in your own heart. And I, you mean, four questions, Mark? I mean, the only question here is, do I tell the truth? We'll get to that. That's number four, but there are three questions we've got to ask first. And this first one, you might never have thought about. And it's this. Do I love truth? Oh my God, what difference does that make? Well, to God, it makes pretty much all the difference. I want to take you now to the book of Zechariah. It's the next to the last book of the Old Testament. Zechariah is writing toward the end of that era, the Old Testament era, and the people of God have been in captivity. They sinned against God, and God allowed them to be taken captive. But now that time is just about over, and the people of God are wondering, how can we get back with God? It's a good question. And we'll need that because in our lives, we're going to have seasons, even as God followers, where we kind of get away from God, maybe get a little cold. I've been there. You know, you just, you don't feel like, you feel like when you, when you pray, it feels like God is a million miles away and you just don't enjoy praise like you used to enjoy in church and just maybe some stuff gets to creep into your life that shouldn't be there. And, and if you're God's daughter or God's son, there's going to be a point where you're going to like, how do I get back? And like I say, I've been there. Now, that's what's happening with the people of Zechariah. They want to know how to get back with God. Now, listen to what God says to them in answer. Speak the truth to each other. Do not love to swear falsely. I hate all this, declares the Lord. Verse 19, therefore, love, truth, and peace. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible is talking about the Antichrist and the people that will ultimately receive the mark of the beast 666, either in their hand or their forehead. And here's what the Bible says about them. The Bible says they perish. Why? Because they refused to love the truth. There it is. 
So because it's so prominent in the word of God, I got to ask myself the question, do I love truth? Is truth the love of my heart? Or do I kind of love the gray of life? Number two, I have to ask myself the question, do I want to hear the truth? I mean, you, you know people in your life that don't want to hear the truth. You may work with them. You may have a member of your family. And in love, you've tried to tell the truth to benefit them, but they're kind of like, you know, la, 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 la. I mean, they, they don't want to hear the truth. And you know what? I've got to ask myself the question, do I want to hear the truth? Number three, do I believe the truth? And then, of course, number four, do I tell the truth? And, and I'm going to admit, all of us have work to do here, starting with me. I mean, we, we, we're going to have to do, here's the thing, we've sown some seeds. We might have to do some weeding with some of this. Okay, number two, his second first seed. I never have known what to call this, but for lack of a better term, actually, it's more of a process than specific action. We're going to call it replacement, replacement. I want to read to you Ephesians chapter five, move over to chapter five. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Verse 18, here's my verse. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. The word debauchery there means waste. Instead, be filled with the spirit. Now, alcohol is mentioned here. But I think God is giving us alcohol as an example because the point here is way broader. And just work with me for a moment. If you're a Christ follower and you think about the bad seed that you've dropped, isn't it true that most of our bad seed is mindless? I don't think we get up in the morning and just think, you know what, I'm just going to throw about as much bad seed as I can throw into my dark side. I don't think that. I think what happens is stuff happens, like I shared with you two weeks ago, and then we have an impulse, and we find ourselves acting on that impulse before we think. It's mindless because we are conditioned. Listen, if I, could, if I could meet you, if I could learn about your life, if you could meet me and learn about the things that I do wrong, it wouldn't be long before we've determined that situations in our life and circumstances have conditioned us to just mindlessly drop some toxic seed. Now, here's the construct, and, and again, I, I'm not going to have time to develop this, but if you want to watch this later and then just explore this construct. But here, here are the planks of the construct, and, and think about alcohol has been used as an example. We have a deep-seated need. We feel that need with the wrong thing, number two. Number three, we repeat that behavior and become conditioned to it. Number four, and here's where the real danger comes, we develop an appetite for it. And then after we develop an appetite, we lose sight of that need that started the whole process in the first place, and we're just seeking to fulfill that appetite. Now, someday I'll, I'll, do, a, I'll do teaching just on that construct, but you, that's, how, that's how alcohol abuse works. There's a deep-seated need, fill it with the wrong thing, uh, and then after a while we develop an appetite, and then we forget about that deep-seated need, it's just an appetite for the alcohol, and then people abuse it. I mean, here's the thing. Do you, do you remember the first time you tried the taste of it? How, do you, how does anybody ever develop an appetite for that? But you understand how it works. Now, here's the thing. Alcohol was used, but you can take anything you want to take that's a dark seed and apply it to that principle. I mean, it's just I mean, anger. And, and, and isn't it true that a lot of people that we meet are packing heat? I mean, just normal people. And yet, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's like they have all this steam building up inside of them, something just sort of pokes that steam and out erupts this geyser. And you're like, you know, that, that lady looks so normal. You know, and, and that guy, he, guy seemed like a nice guy and now he's Godzilla. I mean, you know, okay, here's the thing. What happened was there's a deep-seated need somewhere. Anger began to fill that need. And eventually in time, that person now has an appetite for anger. It's true for jealousy, perpetual victimhood, addiction to electronic media. It's just stuff we try to fill our empty hurting place with. But here's the real point here, and, and this is what I really want you to get. Most Christians fail because all they try to do is stop the bad stuff. 
And their focus is on stopping the bad stuff, stopping the anger, but they remain angry. They want to stop the addiction, but they, they stay in bondage to that addiction. See, look at our verse again. The Bible says, do not be drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the spirit. The word that stands out to me there is the word instead. Because you see, if all I try to do is stop what's wrong and I don't replace it with something that will fill that empty hurting spot inside of me, I'm going to stay in bondage to that dark side. I'll find myself going back to it. I mean, Jesus gives us an extreme example, but it's the principle. Jesus talked about a guy that had a demon inside of him and the demon leaves. Listen to what Jesus said. The evil spirit says, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds its former home empty, swept, and in order. Then the spirit finds seven other demons more evil than itself and they enter the person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. What Christ is saying is if we empty a spot of us inside of us that's filled with the dark side and we don't feel it with something different. If we don't replace that anger, if we don't replace that jealousy, if we don't replace that, uh, that dependence on substance with something that is a seed that's sown to the spirit, we'll be worse off than before. You say, well, oh, Mark, what do I replace it with? Okay. These next three seeds, and I'll give them to you real quickly because we're pretty close to being at the end of the service. These are some great replacement seeds. Here's the seed number three. And I got to be honest, in the essence of full disclosure, everything I've taught in this series, this one is really working in my heart. And I, I just want you to know, just because I preach this stuff doesn't mean I'm good at it. I'm just, it's just true. And I don't get any discounts because I'm a pastor. I have to obey just like you have to obey. <laughs> okay. Here's number three. Let's read verse 19, Ephesians 5. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. Number three is praise. First seed number three is praise. Um, I want to talk about something for a moment before I get into this. Some of you think that you really struggle with praise. Did you come in here at New Spring and you see some of us lift our hands and you know, very, very, very expressive in praise, and you're like, I don't know that I, I don't know that I feel that. And you, and you think, I, I'm not good at praise. Praise doesn't come easy for me. Well, it's really important that we don't confuse praise with the expression of praise. They go together. But a person could lift his hands and not be praising. A person could sing and not be praising. Now, obviously, lifting our hands and, and, and praise and singing and praise goes together with praise, but praise doesn't start with the hands. It doesn't start with the lips. We just saw from the word of God, praise starts in the heart. Look at that verse again. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord. So if praise is not the expression of praise, what is praise? And think about what we just learned about replacement a moment ago. Praise, New Spring, is god focus. I mean, I, when I'm studying a biblical concept, I always want to know what's the antitype, what's the opposite, what's, what's the opposite of praise? The opposite of praise is self-focus. Praise is getting our attention off ourself and seeing life from the prospect of the promises of God. Amen. How does this affect family? relationship, dating. All right. Confession's good for the soul. So I'm going to have to confess. This is real. This is, this is real stuff. I'm writing this message Wednesday morning. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting, I'm writing in my office in the house. And I mean, my, where I write at the house, I'm sitting in my chair. I've got my music stand here with all the notes that I've made. And so I'm typing the final sermon. I'm to this point in the sermon. Wednesday morning was a bad morning for me just junk. You know what I'm talking about? You know, and, and nothing major, just junk, just a lot of junk. Problem over here, problem over there. And, and I'm thinking about how it affects me and what am I going to do? And I'm unhappy about this and I'm unhappy about that. And I'm worried about this. You know what I noticed? I noticed that that attitude that I was developing was actually being kind of cast on Mary Alice's day. 
wasn't her problem, but I'm complaining about this and I'm unhappy about this. And I'm looking at what I just saw here and you can imagine how convicted I felt because I'm typing on a message. I'm gonna talk to you about praise and I'm having a really bad morning. So you know what I did? I mean, before I start preaching to you, this message is working through my own personal fabric. I thought, well, if I'm gonna suggest this to New Spring, better start obeying it myself. And I started getting my attention off me and I began to look at all these things I was dealing with through the promises of God. And I noticed that my whole attitude changed. And in the next few moments, guess what happened? I began to express praise. That's when the expressions of praise came out. That's when the singing and the joy. Now, again, I haven't gotten to the point, so don't count that against my time. Okay, now how does this affect the family? Because I've done a lot of teaching through the years to our worship team about what what uh, psalms and hymns and spiritual songs are. But notice that's not what the Bible's talking about. The Bible's not talking about coming to church, singing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. I mean, that would be true, but what the Bible says here is speaking to each other in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Real quickly, what are psalms? Psalms are the word of God put to music. We don't write psalms. God writes psalms. It is the word of God. Hymns, the very word hymn means breakthrough. It means celebration. It means celebrating the goodness of God. What are spiritual songs? Spiritual songs are songs of testimony. It's me sharing with you what God is doing in my life. Now, here's the thing. If the Bible says speaking to each other, husbands, when's the last time that you spoke to your wife with a hymn, with a psalm? Just something you read in the scripture just spoke to your heart and you, you either said that word from the Bible to your wife or you wrote that to her and you shared it with her. When's the last time, moms and dads, that you wrote a piece of a psalm or spoke a piece of a psalm to one of your kids? When's the last time that we felt just the joy of God and we're celebrating with God and we shared it with our husbands and our wives and our kids. When's the last time that we began to think about what God was doing in our lives and we just shared that testimony with our wife or with our kids or with our friends? And if, if a husband would do that, he would be amazed with what, would, with what happened. You say, well, Mark, I'd feel kind of awkward telling my wife something from the Bible. That's because we're too acclimatized to our old person. Better yet, where's the husband and wife who would both do this together? I mean, you just decide, you know what? We're going to find something in the word of God to share with each other. We're going to find something to celebrate today. A lot of stuff's going bad, but we're going to find something to celebrate. And she tells him what she's celebrating in God. He tells her what he's celebrating in God. What if they start doing spiritual songs? And we, we come home at the end of the day and say, it was a rough day, but here's what God did in my life. God did this for me today. And they start sharing that. That's a, that's a couple that's going somewhere and it's not divorce court. You might have to put your smartphone down. Number four, giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Number four is gratitude. By the way, psychology is, is on top of this too. It's not just the Christian community. Psychology is telling us that one of the ways that we can counter depression in our lives, and it's not that, I'm not saying that we shouldn't take medication because medication can have great benefits. I'm just talking about one of the things that all of us can do to enhance our emotional well-being is to be thankful. I mean, this comes from the Bible. It comes from science. If the opposite of praise is self-focus, the opposite of thanksgiving is complaining based on entitlement. And that might tell us why we have such an unhappy nation today because we have a, such a sense of entitlement. The Bible tells us to be thankful in all things. And obviously there are a lot of things in life that are bad that are not God's idea. But the reason why we can be thankful in all things is Romans 8 verse 28 tells us in all things God works for good. It doesn't say all things are good. It's just all things that happen in our life, God is working in it. And now number five. The Bible says, submit to each other out of the reverence of Christ. And this is a big one in the home. Oh, what does submit to each other? It just means meet needs. Meet needs. 
Whenever I think about submitting and meeting needs, there's a story from the Bible that just comes to me. There are 13 guys on a hot April evening. They've been walking on the dusty ground in Judea. And it's, they're going to have a meal together in a room. And, you know, all those pictures that we see in Christian art, a lot of them are not right because it shows these guys sitting at a table. That's not how people ate in those days. It might be a little short table on the floor, but people ate in those days by lying on their side you know, in a semi-reclining position. Well, you got 13 sweaty guys in a room. It's not very genteel, but somebody's feet are going to be right by your face. And nobody was washing the feet. I mean, after all, I guess they should have washed their own feet, but ladies, you know how men are. And uh, they didn't. And you know what happened next? The most important person in the universe got up, cinched up his robe, took a basin of water and a towel, and he ran, went around and washed all their feet. Now, through the years, I've met people that they had kind of a thing. They wanted to wash feet, actually wash feet. And, and there's nothing wrong with that, I guess. It's just not what Jesus had in mind here. Because um, we don't walk on hot, dusty roads in Judea. We drive Toyotas and Fords. And we wear shoes. that are closed. And we have showers. No, that, that's not what we need today. Washing feet means I put your needs ahead of mine. This is really important in the family because it's a seed. You're like, well, my wife doesn't deserve me doing. Wait, 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 wait. Are you sowing your seed in your wife's soil? Are you sowing it in your soil? Do you want a blessing? You're like, Mark, I have teenagers. I know, I know. It's not about what they understand right now. It's about the harvest that you want. Well, those are the first seeds. Those are five. And again, this is a workshop. I mean, because here's the deal. We're, 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 gonna do, we're gonna approach this message in one of two ways. We're either gonna just walk out of here and go to lunch and say, okay, I heard Mark talk today and uh, nice talk and leave it. Or are we gonna recognize this has absolutely nothing to do with Mark? The Mark's working on this too. We heard the word of God today. We heard how to revolutionize our lives. We heard five seed that we'll drop in the soil of our new person in Jesus Christ. We will start a peaceful revolution in our lives. And then get on top of this and start running our words and thoughts and actions and um, attitudes through the grid of what we've seen today. Well, let's just bow our heads for a moment because somebody could be here today and say, Mark, you mentioned a moment ago that some of us are still exploring. I would really love to have God in my life. How do I get that? Well, not joining our church. <laughs> That's great, but that won't, that won't bring God into your life. Someone will say, well, Mark, is it joining a particular religion or being baptized or doing good works? Those are all wonderful things. If, if the religion is, is of the Bible. But the only way to have God in your life is to receive him, the Holy Spirit, as a gift. The Bible tells us Jesus paid for it. You and I can't live a perfect life, so God sent his son Jesus into the world to live the life that we can't live. And then after he lived that perfect life, he hung on a cross, and the way God saw it, he paid the debt, he paid the bill for all your and my wrongdoing so that we could receive Jesus' perfect life. And our sin could be placed on him. Three days later, he arose from the grave. And here's what the word of God promises. That any man or woman, boy or girl, who will invite Jesus Christ in, believe that he died for them, believe that he rose from the grave, and ask to be forgiven and restored, can be forever, for eternity saved. And then the spirit of God will move into your life and you'll have that power to live the life that you never dreamed of. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And if you want to pray with me, you certainly can do this. You can say your own words if you wish, but if you'd like to pray with me, I'll pray each line slowly so you can decide what you want to say to God. Here we go. Dear God, I am a sinner. I can't fix myself. 
but I believe you love me very much. I believe Jesus died for my sins and I believe he arose from the grave. And since Jesus is alive, I want him to be my savior and my Lord, my King. Thank you for hearing my prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Hey, if you just pray with me, I have a gift I want to give you. Now, you may be watching on television. You may be watching online. It doesn't matter. You can get this. All you have to do is take out your smartphone. It's okay. Take it out now. Take out your smartphone <laughs> and text the word prayed, P-R-A-Y-E-D to 97,000. There's a new spring Bible, just like I preach from. There's a little book that I wrote called My New Walk with God that'll answer a lot of questions. There's a cool journal in here that you, you can write down your notes and maybe some other coupons. So if you're watching online or on television, all you have to do is text pray to 97,000, follow the instructions and we'll get this out to you. If you're here on campus today and you just pray with me, all you got to do is go back to any guest services and just say, I pray with Mark. They'll give this to you. You can take it home today. Thank you. Next week, the Jesus Seeds. 